Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our time management course. So excited to be sharing this with you. Yes, I did play beach volleyball this morning, if you're wondering. Beautiful morning. So thinking about time, do you find yourself getting stressed during the day or creating like an artificial stress on yourself that you should be doing things and they pile up? Or you find yourself procrastinating and not kind of starting or getting through what you should be doing or not quite finishing it? Or you just know that you should be using your time better, but you're not sure why. Or there's external factors that impact your day and just stop you achieving what you really want to achieve for the day. This course will change your world overnight, I promise you. And you'll get great at it after a few days, but overnight results is what we're aiming for. And the way we'll get there is by going from theory to action to your results really quickly in a framework that you can apply today. That's what we're going to do on this course. Let's dive in. So we didn't just want to start with the theory and the history. This year we went out to 24 countries and did research in country and got it all back on how folks manage their time now. And across these countries, we asked people these questions. What do you do well? Where do you think you could improve? How could you innovate time management for your particular circumstances? And where does it go wrong? What things do you need to mitigate against to protect your day, to protect your time, or to get a better outcome at the end of each day? And what a fantastic group of participants. We had business owners, entrepreneurs, investors, senior managers, mid-level managers getting pulled in all directions, team leaders, frontline staff, freelancers, mums with kids, mums with kids starting a business, such a great diverse group of folks. And you saw all the cultures coming back too, right? South America, Southern Europe, Mid-Europe versus Northern Europe, uh, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Yeah, just such a fantastic mix of people who've contributed to this and we're packaging the thinking into this course. And really overnight, you should be able to apply it and see the results for yourself. And uh, I'm just excited to share it. You know, hard to get excited on camera, but I am. So here we are. That's the research we, we asked the folks. And this is the main insights we got back. Top performers plan each day in advance. They don't roll into the day, start checking emails, getting distracted. They think through how they're gonna approach the day and what they wanna get out of the day before the day starts, normally early morning or the day before. Many people get mobile centric during the day. So at the moment, most are using pen and paper to plan the day and then they're relying on their mobile during the day, which goes to the third point. They're capturing things to do and ideas during the day on the go. And many people are dropping that into their calendar app and filling the calendar app up, which is not ideal as you'll learn later today. So for nearly everyone, the day doesn't go to plan. So don't feel bad. It's the case all around the world for all the different roles, internal and external to a company. Just doesn't go to plan. And uh, I like number five, folks love crossing things off, which is an attraction for paper. So any tech needs to give the same sort of experience. People love the idea, I've got that done, I've got that done, I've got that done. Most people run two calendars. So they have their work calendar with their colleagues and they have a personal calendar for their private life. And some have a third calendar for family. So they're juggling three calendars plus all the other things. Generally, it boils down to setting priorities, having to-dos, and capturing lists so you don't forget things. That's kind of what most people use to manage their time. And it surprised me, number eight, this was well more established than I thought it would be because we've just come out of COVID, but at least 40% of the participants were already using automated booking engines, something we're gonna talk about today. So that means they're already on this idea of keeping your calendar empty so automated apps like Calendly can book the appointments for you and you're not getting into that back and forth. And number nine, top performers really understand they must plan their day around how they like to work. For example, I like to do deep creative thinking type work early in the morning whilst I'm fresh. That suits me. Whereas some of the mid-level managers we interviewed, that would create more stress for them because they know people are waiting on them each day to get going in the morning. So they like to do all the things that folks are waiting on that are dependent, 
before they can clear their desk and then get into some deep thinking and creative work. So for some people that was after lunch. For me, early morning. The point is, you really need to ask yourself that question and then plan your day around that, which we're gonna cover. So here is the course outline. We're gonna to touch on the history and where it's going with the thinking and the frameworks for time management. And rather than bog you down in a whole lot of theory and detailed methodologies, what we're gonna do is boil it down to five questions to ask yourself. And then there's five key attributes you really need to know, regardless of which framework you wanna apply. So we're gonna boil it down to that and then go straight into theory to action, which is what makes this course so different. Like I said, overnight results is what we're aiming for and uh, looking forward to your feedback, whether or not we achieve that for you. Let's go. So let's start with a brief history of time management. So it really became topical in the 60s and it was all about clocking time, looking at where the time went and trying to do things faster and faster. So it was efficiency focus based on tracking time and some great thinking came out of the back of that. And then the Eisenhower matrix, President Eisenhower from the States was made fam famous in the 80s by Stephen Covey. And that methodology was to look at tasks or to-dos based on what's urgent and what's important. So if it's not urgent and it's not important, you really shouldn't be doing it. And you wanna spend as much time as you can on things that are important and not urgent. That's the strategic box. If you're in the top left box, you're firefighting all the time. So this was a framework where you could sort of help organize your to-dos. We're gonna look at more frameworks in a moment. And then those of you who can remember or are old enough to remember, the 90s became huge on time management. And I just wanna tell you this story because there's so many uh, folks, millennials and younger, that didn't even know this was a thing. So back in the 90s, we used to carry these leather bound binders and I've included a photo of one there. And it was all done by hand, you know, and some of the methodologies, what are, what are my life goals? What are my five year goals? What do I wanna get done this year? How does that go down to the month? And then plan the week and plan the day. And we do it all by hand and then rewrite it and do it the next day. But there were so many good attributes, I'll call them, in, this, in the study of time management. And there was courses. And there was a point in time where you pretty much had to have, you had to know what you're talking about in time management if you're going to a job interview and including knowing how to help other people manage their time better in your team, applying these methodologies and frameworks. And sadly, all of that went out the window when we switched to digital calendars towards the end of the 90s. So Google Calendar and the like. Great tools, I love them, but the actual methodologies and thinking behind that was really big in the 90s all disappeared almost overnight. And I see that today. People don't have the core skills in time management. So we're gonna go straight to that thinking back then and then apply it in a way that works today. Something I saw more recently is Rory Vaden's focus funnel. And some would argue it's a combination of the previous methodologies, but what caught my eye, and I love, Google the video, his uh, TED talk, TEDx talk is fantastic. What I really like is this focus on automation before you start delegating. So constantly looking at things that if it's repeating, how do we get rid of it? And that's definitely come through the late 90s and definitely through 2000s in the last 20 years. And when you look at this journey, which is all about, as it says in red at the bottom, you know, am I working on the right things? Am I doing it efficiently in the right order? And am I also planning and keeping track of the time so I learn from where my time goes? So that's been the journey through this 40, 50 year period. And along the way, different frameworks have come up. And here's seven of my favorites. Now I'm not gonna drag you through each of these cause I'll put you to sleep. And the other reason I won't do it is different things work for different people, but I notice they all run out of puff. So if you start off with the two minute rule, and someone gets going on that and they're all excited, a few months later, they'll stop doing it. Same with getting things done, focusing on deep versus shallow, time boxing, etc. So what I want you to do is go and have a look at those, watch some short videos, and then you'll be able to take what you're learning on this course and bring it alive in a way that's sustainable. So it won't run out of puff after a few months, or you can change which framework you use, but the core methodology, the way we run each day, to optimize our time, which you're gonna learn from this course, that won't change. It's just how you're organizing within that 
it'll become clear soon, trust me. Anyway, just to mention those methodologies. And now if we just move that up and we think about where it's going next. So this year and leading through COVID, you know, a lot more talk around health and well-being, work-life balance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this this concept of achieving balance between all of the factors in your life is now a key focus of time management. And then I think where it's heading next is giving people far more involvement, visibility, belief in the purpose of what you're trying to do as a team or as an individual, as a team and as an organization. We'll come on to that one in future. Today, we're gonna to focus on the balance framework. So let's talk about this concept work-life balance. So if you look at the work things, you've got all of this pulling on your time. And what strikes me as interesting, it's kind of a similar list to what's pulling on your personal time. And what came out of the research was people think of these things almost as one, particularly younger people. So if I've got 10 things to do today, they're not really getting too caught up. Is it work or is it personal? So the mechanics of managing your time and the different aspects from more strategic, reflective exercise and so forth down to going to a meeting, doing a call, getting a task done, they're kind of similar on each side. So this trend to think of them both together and solve them together and then in a way that balances the two so that you remove your stress, get what you need to get done, feel productive and feel great at the beginning, during and at the end of each day. This is what's really important. And we're gonna focus on helping you solve this balance overnight on this course. And I put the word capacity there in the middle. It's not just the balance. What each of these things do is they eat into your capacity to do other things. So the ba balancing one against the other is also around proactively managing your capacity, which you're going to see becomes a key attribute that we cover in this course. Now I said at the beginning, we're gonna boil this right down to five key questions and five key attributes. And we're gonna dive into those a little bit and then we're gonna move straight into how you can apply it so you have results overnight. The first question to ask yourself, when do I do my best deep work? Now I answered this for you before. If you've got a pen and paper or an iPad with a pen or whatever it is, just write down quickly the first thing that comes to mind for you. If you were gonna do two, three, four hours of really good work each day, when would you do that and, and feel that you're giving it your best creative thinking without distractions or anything else? And it's not just about you, but it's also about your environment and other commitments on your time, as I mentioned before. But you need to know what the answer to that is because it's gonna help you set up your day, each day for success. So the second thing to ask yourself is fitness training. When does that work best for you? When do you love doing it and don't feel like it's a chore or it's interrupting or it's getting in the way of other things? Or even if it did, you carved out that time and you protected it because that's the time you love to train and exercise. Thirdly, if you have family and loved ones, then protecting time to be with them, but not just time after dinner at night or when the young kids are tired. Think about it, when is the best time to have with your family and it's different for different families. But I know when my children were younger, they had all that energy after school and were keen to play and have fun. And traditionally that's towards the end of the working day and I'm trying to wrap up and get things done. In hindsight, I would have blocked that time out every day of the week and then still delivered on my capacity from a work perspective at some point in the day. Way easier to manage that now post COVID with people being more flexible, more open-minded around getting work done when it suits you best as a person. But you still, you need to manage it. So again, write that down for your family. When are you gonna have the best quality time each day and how does that change during the working week? Just how much time do you need to do all of these things? Thinking, recreation, fun, learning, and eating and, and uh, drinking healthy every day. So. Obviously that depends on who's doing what in the household and how you've got things organized and how you're living. But really, again, don't cut short on this because your well-being over time and happiness is gonna be impacted by whether you have time for these things. 
And likewise, your career will be impacted if these things start taking over and you're not managing the balance between the two. It's a two-way street. And then lastly, I won't debate this online. You can read all the aviation books around the need for eight hours sleep pilot series by Captain Trevor Tom. I think there's pages of research and explanations on this topic. So that needs to be managed too. So if you're getting up at 6 a.m. every day to get to sleep by 10, how long does it take you to get to sleep? Work your way backwards and choose a time so you start getting yourself to bed in a nice rhythm and cadence, at least in my view, Sunday to Thursday, if you're working Monday to Friday. There's a little pro tip down the bottom there. You don't wanna put these in your work calendar. What you wanna do is start blocking this time in your personal calendar. So I mentioned before, I, use, I have a Google personal calendar and we use Google for work, but you might use Microsoft um, at the office. Have your personal calendar set up so that you're blocking out these times. And then on the automated booking apps that are hitting your work calendar, I use Calendly, you wanna also protect this time so that people aren't booking your work calendar on those slots. More of that will become obvious later. So they're the five key questions to ask yourself before we can get into going from theory to action to results. Protecting this time and understanding when you do your best work and your best fitness is fundamental to your approach to time management and it's individual to you. So take a moment just to quickly, normally the first thing answer you write down is the right answer, the first thing that comes to mind. So don't overthink it and you can change it. But the main thing is to start and start protecting this time before we go forward. Okay, so I said we need five key questions answered and we need an understanding of five key attributes. Now, all of this came out of the 90s. We've updated it with the changes in working style, the insights from the research, and also the way we use technology today and how we're going to use technology in future. And we're gonna use technology, of course, on this course. So this is just a little bit of theory and you can call them attributes or building blocks. Once you master these and how we're going to apply it, you'll be able to then go back and apply any methodology and swap and change and you'll just get better and better. But this will give you results overnight, I promise you. So let's dive into it. Number one. Priorities. It's a fundamental building block of time management, and I'll hand over to Ash to explain more. Okay, thank you, Ash. So, number one, priorities. So, different views on this. Uh, I'm not a great believer in setting personal goals for the year and doing that affirmation every January and getting disappointed come uh, Christmas, New Year's. So, um, it's up to you. But best practice everyone we've talked to around the world who's performing really well on time or in their career profession, good on work-life balance, everything else, they're all at least getting the month and week priority sorted out. So that's what we'll focus more on in this course. I know in the 90s when time management hit its peak, it was all around life goals, 10-year goals, five-year goals, one-year goals, breaking that down to the quarter and so forth. Um, you'll see as you get to know the tech a little bit better later on, you can see you can do that with the company. So one to three year horizon for the company, breaking down to quarterly objectives and then key results. That's the framework that's become mainstream since about 2018, even though it's been around since the 60s. A great book you might want to read, Richard Rummelt, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. And uh, the first 100 pages of that book really goes into how almost all great theory you come across now and thought leaders and the presentations you go to, you can dig back and find that thinking somewhere in the last 200 years. So I just make that point. A lot of what we're seeing now with time management is thinking in theory that's been there before. And I think some of that evolution, there's a bit of overlap that I showed you before and I didn't want to uh, pick on uh, anybody or any frameworks. So um, yeah, me personally, all about the month, personal priorities, and then making sure you set the week before you start the week. So um, probably you wanna have something like five maximum priorities for the week for work, and then you whatever you have for personal, you know, three to five personal priorities for the week. Um, if you've got more than five, you're probably making a to-do list in my opinion. So what you're doing is you're trying to say, hey, these are the outcomes I'm trying to get to for the week. So use the word priority or outcome, and then separately go, right, what am I gonna to do today towards those outcomes? That's the framework. Back to you, Ash. Thank you, Ash. Now, number two, the to-dos. 
We all have to-dos. You saw it on the balance framework. We have work to-dos and we have personal to-dos. There's some attributes within those we also need to understand if we're going to optimize our time. So Ash? Okay, so the next one is to-dos. So a few sub-attributes under the attribute of to-dos. Quick and longer to-dos. The reason for the distinction is some people have a whole lot of quick to-dos. If you're in a support role, you might have, say, I don't know, 50 quick to-dos you've got to do today. Call someone back, book a hotel, um, order these products, whatever they are. So what we want to do is separate out all the quick to-dos from the longer to-dos so that we can schedule the longer ones around your calendars. So that's where we're heading with the distinction. And the distinction we make is uh, less than equal, so greater than equal to <laughs> Greater than equal to 15 minutes is a longer to-do, and less than that can go in the quick to-do columns. And then we'll talk about allowances and so forth. Um, the next thing to think about is your plan time. So that's particularly important for the longer to-dos. So if, if things take 30 minutes, 45, 90 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, it quickly adds up during the day. So what we wanna do before we start the day, we wanna know what all our to-dos are, and then we also want to know the planned time for each of the to-dos. This is all heading towards that point I said before about capacity. The key to balancing work-life balance is to understand up front your capacity. And planned time is a big part of that. Then you want to also be tracking your actual time. Not so important for the beginning of applying this course. But over time, you want to start tracking what's your actual time. So if you plan 30, that took me 45. This one here took me 60. I got that one done a bit quicker. This only took 15 and this took 30. Understanding this picture over time will help you get better at planning your time. And again, not over committing at the beginning of the day. Uh, all time management frameworks focus on, hey, keep an eye on what you must do today. And then per the philosophy we've been going through on this course, organize the day around what suits you. So for some people, they just have to clear the must-dos right at the beginning of the day, and then they can relax thereafter, not relax, but then feel less stressed thereafter and get on to other things. So um, that's less of a case for me. I just need to be aware of them, make sure I've allocated enough time, and that they're occurring in a point of the day that suits my rhythm. Remembering I keep the mornings free for deep work. So just because I must submit a financial statement or I must pay an invoice or a uh, make a particular phone call. For me, it doesn't happen, have to happen first thing in the day to free me up from a stress point of view. As long as it's scheduled and the time's allocated, it can wait until the afternoon because that's typically when I'll get through those things really quickly. Um, importance is, is important. Um, there used to be sort of this ABC framework in the 90s. So A was you must do and B, you, uh, you should do it and uh, C, you're into into hope land and for you know all of us in operational leadership roles you know c typically gets delegated or doesn't get done um but yeah that's for me that more is reflected these days in the order right so you set in the order based on how you like to work factory in your personal calendar factory in your capacity for the day and then the order kind of takes care of this for me so i don't feel a need to go through and label every single to-do, A, B, or C, um, the order will mark the priority, providing I know what I must do for the day. And then I'll set the order and away I'll go. Back to you, Ash. Thank you, Ash. Calendars. So I've talked already about work and personal calendars and this trend to keep them free of to-dos so that the automated booking engines can work and also we can plan our day based on capacity. Remember, work-life balance, it's not just deciding where to put the time and juggling and being effective and not procrastinating, but it's also proactively managing capacity. Key thing we're going to come on to, Ash. Calendars, a key attribute to get our head around. So I showed you before, we were writing everything down by hand before. The calendar was by hand, the day was by hand, the to-dos were by hand, the quick actions were by hand, everything was by hand. And then along in the end of the 90s came digital calendars, completely have taken over the last 20 years. So most people, as we said before, have a work and a personal calendar. Some have a family calendar. And what you're doing is you, you, you know, you're trying to see, hey, what have I got on from a work point of view and a personal point of view? 
and therefore where are the free spots that I can get things done and that's what we're constantly juggling with each day and then you have all the interruptions come here which nowadays are crazy instant messages email phone calls and then of course uh, last minute appointments and meetings if you're in a role that needs to do those on the automated booking engines I set a lead time of 12 hours for good reason so so the whole idea of planning my day around a way that suits me that I can be productive is also protecting the time so whilst I open up my calendar so that anyone can book me per preference that suits them I have a 12 hour lead time on it so it's not messing around the day that I've already planned and then it also gives me time to reassess if I want to actually take that meeting or delegate it to somebody else okay so the uh, that's what I was just getting to I guess there with uh, keeping the calendars free of to-dos. I was surprised in the research, as I said before, that 40% or so of people have already cottoned on to this. So you don't want to be piling your to-dos into your work calendar. You want to keep those. Uh, so if you've got you know, two meetings for the day uh, or three meetings for the day, you want to keep that as empty as possible. So these automated booking apps, Calendly is what we use, but there's, there's many. Um, I should be getting commissions from, I keep mentioning them, I'm not. Um, so that folks can come in here and book these meetings. And like I said before, you can set all the configurations, uh, lead time that they can jump into your diary, how many of those types of appointments would happen per day, etc., etc. So I have all that automated, there's no back and forth, no time wasted. And if you have an assistant, they're not wasting their time on just trying to manage your diary, just automate it. But the concept is to keep your work calendar free of to-dos and likewise your personal calendar. Um, we'll come on to how to do that later when we get to the tech part, but it's extremely important. And then we mentioned here capacity calculation for the day. So what we're trying to do there is get to what's our target work hours for the day. So if you're trying to do eight hours of work in the day, then that's really gonna take into account what's going on on your calendar. And we'll come onto this in a minute, but target work hours basically going to be your to-dos, your calendar events, and your allowance for your role, which we described before. Remember, HR might need more, a CEO may need more, a product lead or someone in an R&D role, perhaps 15, 30 minutes a day, they're not gonna get interrupted more than that. Just depends on your role. You need to be aware of it because it is part of your capacity. So your ability to to plan out work and get things done is really dependent on whether you use that allowance or not and whether you've made sure you've uh, taken it into account. And then the other thing is if uh, you also might have a quick to-do uh, allowance based on the quick to-dos you've set for the day, we said before. So I have hardly any quick to-dos in a day, 15 minutes would be the most. Um, but again, if you're in a support role, you could have two hours of quick to-dos. So if they're not factored in to your capacity, then we're going to be out of whack on capacity. Okay, so calendars are important. The world's changed. So we're digital on calendars. We need our to-dos to float around the calendars and we need to keep our calendars empty of to-dos so the automated booking apps can do their thing and therefore free up our time and all the back and forth. Don't worry, we're going to solve it easily. It's all coming in a moment. Thank you, Ash. That's number three done. So number four, unplanned time. What a great topic this is. And I learned about it in my 20s, forgot about it, and have come back to appreciate the importance of it. In all of our roles, we need to make an allowance for unplanned time, Ash. Okay, the fourth attribute, I was just talking to it before on capacity, unplanned time, worth its own statement by itself. So it's the number one contributor to stress from the research and also articles and desk-based research, but certainly all the folks we interviewed from those 24 countries around the world. Um, so if it's two or three per country, I'd say at least two thirds say that they underestimate interruptions during the day. Um, well, they call it interruptions, but then when they look back at it, it's kind of consistent every day or consistent on a flow, you know, more on Tuesday or Wednesday and less on a Friday, for example. But they could also map it out for their role and their circumstances. So for middle level managers, a lot of the feedback was just constant interruptions from above. And uh, it's something uh, we're doing some work on around how to make managing up a lot easier in the new world, particularly with technology, but uh, more on that next year. So unplanned time. So I mentioned before, for me, 
Um, it's 30 minutes a day is usually plenty. At the moment, we're going through a period with new products and changes in the company where I'm having to increase that a few days a week to 60 minutes a day. So if I'm not factoring that in and I'm trying to jam to-dos in around my calendar appointments, then I'm over committing for the day versus my target capacity. So um, if I'm running my capacity at 10 hours, uh, 10 hours a day, and I'm really trying to hit that with productive work that adds value, and I'm underestimating interruptions, then really it's 11 hours a day. So I'm already sort of pushing the limit a bit, um, you know, for someone you know, my age. Um, I'm already smacking it as hard as I can. And then if I'm underestimating by an hour, that's quite a big impact. It's gonna affect family time and uh, evening time and also maybe um, what time I get to bed. And I want that eight hours sleep we talked about before. So that's the key message. It is part of your capacity that we are moving to a stage where we're setting a target and we're proactively managing to that target. More on that in a moment. We're going to make it easy. Thank you, Ash. Five, capacity. I mentioned it before with work-life balance, that whole balancing act between my work life and my personal life. So it's just a combination of managing the priorities and what you want to spend your time on, but you also have to understand what time have I got to work with. And what we're going to do on this course is make sure your understanding of that is proactive. So you're in control of it at the beginning of the day, as the day goes through, and towards the end of the day as you think about the next day. And of course, your work capacity needs to be based on you. So if what you do, say if it was deep science, deep research, R&D, painting, art, if four or five hours is the maximum that you can be efficient and productive, then that's your capacity you want to plan to. Whereas in other roles or other people, you might be able to pump out a good eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I used to be able to do 12 hours a day, six days a week. Now it's not the case. I need to really make sure that I'm focused and productive and working at my best time, best capacity each day. Ash. So number five, capacity. You should be getting your head around it already. We're just gonna ram it home by making it its own attribute. So I've mentioned a couple of times, I'm typically trying to hit 10 hours productive work per day. And I said before, it includes calendar time and event, uh, my allowance time and my to-dos time and a quick to-do to do allowance as well. You love my writing, I should be a doctor. So. Um, that, that's my target work hours for the day. And therefore, as I'm allocating plan time, so the calendar is automatic, of course, the allowance I'm setting for each day of the week. So I think on Mondays now, I'm allowing 60 minutes on Mondays, seem to get more interruptions. This is the plan time per to-do, which we went through before. So that might add up to say 340 minutes, I could have, uh, say, 320 minutes of calendar appointments, recurring meetings, one-off meetings, last-minute meetings. And then I'm, I don't tend to have too many quick to-dos, but maybe I've got 30 minutes of quick to-dos. If you add all that up and divide it, so let's uh, just say for argument's sake, that's 5, uh, 10, 11. Let's say it's called, it's 11.5. I know it's not, but let's just say this all adds up to 11.5. Divided by my target, you can see I'm at 115% capacity. Now, that's not too bad for most folks, but if you're already pushing the envelope a little bit, not so good. So what I can do there is actually bring my planning back to eight hours, which will also give me some room if things don't go to plan on the day and they run over, particularly if I underestimate plan time on to-dos, which I tend to do. So it would be smart for me to bring my target work hours of all, across all these things back to eight hours and then be trying to run the, uh, so this then would be showing me, um, you know, I'm at 145% before I start the day. So I know something has to go before I start the day. Cause if I, if I'm planning for eight hours and it's at 145%, I know I'm gonna fail, I'm setting myself up to fail. So the whole concept here as written there, is to, before you start, know your capacity time and therefore also know what time you're going to finish at the end of the day, to know that at the beginning. And then we're going to show you a way you can actually keep track of that as the day progresses using tech, of course. So you don't be, you don't be working out all these numbers and the finish time. But 
as your day is progressing, one to-do is taking a little bit longer or a meeting's run over, it'll look, this where we're heading with this, uh, what we're gonna show you, it'll immediately say, hey, you've just gone from 6 p.m. finish to 7.15, your capacity's gone up from 110% to 130, and you've got this much work left to do, do you wanna reschedule? So it's not gonna prompt you and interrupt you, of course, but you'll just see all that and you'll make that decision as you're flowing. So that's the fifth attribute, capacity. And uh, I'll say it again, it's the key to work-life balance, ba balancing that uh, all the things you've got on the work side, all the things on the personal side, they're very similar. So managing them in the same space makes sense. But knowing how much capacity you've got is also fundamental to the balance, not just taking things in and out or prioritizing them, but can they work together in the first place is fundamental and that's the capacity side and often overlooked and we're gonna focus on it a lot during this course. It's the key to changing your life overnight, getting immediate results overnight and then getting better at it per what I said before, learning what to refine, either get better at planning the time or lowering your target as you start the day. So guys, that's it. Five questions, five attributes. We're ready to go from theory to action and overnight results. Let's go. Hey guys, if you've been watching this webinar on a tablet device or your mobile, now's the time to bring that next to a laptop or a desktop because this next part you'll need a laptop or a desktop to participate and do it together. So I want you to go to on the laptop desktop stratapsas.com, click on get started and then do the little onboarding screens that pop up to add your personal and your work calendars. You'll land inside a time management page that looks something like this. So I've got this set for the 19th of December. You'll come in and arrive today. That's perfectly fine. Or you can plan tomorrow as part of the course here. So first thing I want you to do is click on your avatar at the bottom left. And then you'll see here you've got these settings and defaults that you can configure, applying those attributes that we talked to before. So the allowance will be 45 minutes per day by default. I've increased mine to one hour. You can change your work hours and your standard start time for the week. And then after you've passed the start time, you can see there you can't edit it. But uh, in terms of the defaults, click here and you'll be able to edit. Make sure the time zone is the time zone you're in and it should be the same time zone ideally as your device. And then you can leave this here as send to queue. So you can see here I've connected my personal calendar and I've got my work calendar connected. And then when I go to the time page, the work calendar items have come through in dark blue and then my personal calendar is showing in yellow. So that'll be the same for you. And if you've connected both as work calendars, just come back in here, click on the avatar and click there and you'll be able to designate one or the other so that the color coding works when it comes through to you. So we talked before a lot about capacity. And what this here is creating is a combined view of your personal work calendars. And then it's automatically scheduling your longer to-dos around those calendar events. And then you can see as your day starts exactly where you're at based on this dashboard. So, so far I've got none out of four of the longer to-dos completed. I've got this much work remaining. None of it I've marked as must to do today. And this is the free time I've got available. So if I scroll down, I'll see that spread each side of the allowance, noting I've got one hour as my setting for the allowance. You can always check that at the top of the page um, if you might've changed it earlier that day. So what's this telling me? I've got 64% capacity so far planned for today. And the capacity, as we mentioned earlier, is taking into account its work capacity. So the idea here is I like to take a good chunk of time out in the middle of the day, as you can see, to go and do some thinking, go to the gym, have a nice lunch, catch up, catch up on messages. So I still, even though I, that's my routine because it energizes me and enables me to really focus when I'm working, I still wanna make sure that I'm putting in a full day's work based on my target capacity, which in reality is more like 10 hours, but for this video, I'll do eight hours. So you can see, I know before my day starts, I've got at least all of this time that I could participate in other meetings or drag things 
out of the queue that I didn't get done yesterday or last week and I can drag them down here and then they will automatically schedule here. So this is planning the day for you automatically and it's applying the order that you choose. So you're in control. So if you wanna move three up to the beginning of the day to be the first task, then that will sync across and there it is. Now it's the first task at my start time for the day on this day and then number task number one's now there and four is here. Super powerful. So it's applying your preferences. It's not taking over, but it's automatically figuring out the day for you based on the order you set for the to-dos and then the plan time that you've allocated against each of the longer to-dos. So the default's 30, but you can see here I've changed this one to one hour. And if I go in and edit task number one, and let's say I'll make that an hour and a half, you can see now my capacity will go, has gone from 64 up to 76%. So I'm still in the green zone, I'm under 100, I've still got available time, and you can see that dropping in at the bottom of my schedule. So as you add more things here, your capacity percentage increases. It'll go orange at some point, and then it'll go red to let you know, hey, you've really allocated a lot of work for the day. You remember on the course before, we said the research best practice, people plan their week before they start the week. And that happens here on the left, where you can set your week priorities, keep an eye on your month priorities. And remember also, people like to do their work and their personal life in the same place. So you can see here this priority for the month I've got it there is a personal one. And I could come in here on the three dot menu and say, hey, this task here is also a personal task. So that there has now will drop out of my capacity. You can see it's gone from 76 back to 70 because that's no longer a work task and I've marked it personal. I could come up here also and say this is a must do. So now I know that here I'm planning to do deep work for one hour and it's scheduled after lunch, not bad. I'm still waiting on others for that, so I may not want to start it, and if I haven't received what I'm looking to receive from others, I can actually drag that down and schedule it for later in the day to give more time for those things to come in. So you can see as you work down, you can say, right, I've got some tasks that are pointing to my monthly priorities, that's good. I've got something pointing to my weekly priorities. I've got these must-do things that aren't really my priorities, but I've just got to do them. And then I've got some deep work scheduled for after lunch this afternoon. Now we mentioned before the importance of getting the allowance right for your role. And if you come under here, you'll notice you can set the allowance for different days of the week. And you can see here, I've got more allowance on Monday, Friday, and Wednesday, because I tend to get more interruptions on those days. And it's a result of the way we run and plan the week and catch up on things as the week progresses. Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, of course, I've got it really tight. So very few interruptions from colleagues, customers, partners, et cetera, et cetera. But even then I can't get it down to zero except on Sunday where I'm uh, off sailing and having a great time. And then that allowance will then spread across your sh schedule. The reason this is so important is it stops you from feeling like you're not getting through what you should be getting through for the day. So my capacity here, I'm under capacity and I've got a one hour allowance for interruptions. So I definitely know that I can take on more work here for this day to deliver on my target work hours of eight hours while still having a swim in the ocean, having brekkie down there and having a good break during the day to recharge and then hit the afternoon evening schedule because that's how I like to work. Some people have a lot of quick to do's to do. So particularly if you're in an administrative or sales support or secretarial support, or EA, something like that, you may have 50 quick to-dos to do in a day. And they're all things under 15 minutes. So when you go to schedule them, they're five or 10. And if you change any of these to five or 10, they'll automatically flick across to the quick to-do column. And then they get added up to a quick to-do allowance because if you've got 10, 20, 30 things here, you don't want that filling up your combined schedule. It's gonna to be too messy. So they get grouped into one allowance period. So when you get to that on the schedule and that you have the red line moving down here and it's not showing because this is a future date if I was doing this on today, then you'd see the red line moving down through the day. But when you get to this, you'll know that this is the time to work through this list. So if you end up with 50 of these here, don't worry, you'll have enough quick to do allowance on your schedule so that you can have time to get those things done. So 
Going back to the 90s, I remember the number one exercise they used to get us to do was to fill out all of the things you want to do tomorrow, assuming it was a work day. And so I encourage you now just to take a moment to start adding all of the to-dos you'd like to do tomorrow and just put them in from wherever you've got them and then adjust the time you think each to-do will take, adjust the order and then make sure that the calendars are connected so then you get a view of your capacity. And what we found during those courses and then also during the research is just about everyone, particularly high achievers, conscientious workers, overcommit during the day. And I find myself doing the same thing. Even if I'm trying to hit 10 hours productive capacity, I'm accidentally planning like 12, 14 hours of work. And the app will quite often say, hey, you're gonna finish at 11.30 at night and you're running at 140% and you're already trying to start at 10. So it's fantastic for just letting you know right at the beginning, hey, that's way too much. So you then need to start applying one of those frameworks to delegate or eliminate the work or to reorganize it in a way that's gonna be achievable for you. So if you applied the time boxing method, your approach might be to say, hey, I'm not gonna remove any of these things because they're all important and I wanna move them forward and I like variety. So what I'll do is I'll time box how much time I'm gonna spend. So I'll move them all forward a little bit and through that process, perhaps I can figure out how to delegate and involve other people. Okay guys, it's as easy as that. You've got the five questions, the five attributes, the tool, it's free. You might wanna explore these other things in the tool, that's up to you, that there's a workspace with live meeting notes, work boards and tasks. You can capture ideas on the go proactively manage risks. You can set objectives and key results for the quarter and for your team. And you can also lay out your strategy for your team, your function, or your company. This is all in the app. You get it for free as an individual. And then of course, to uh, add more colleagues, you'll need to pay, but it's, uh, it's not expensive in the pricing. You'll see it on the website. If you have any issues, just click on your avatar. And if you scroll down here, you'll see there's boards at the bottom here that you can let folks know what you love, suggest features to improve the product, suggest some future ideas, ask a question. If something's bothering you that's minor, put it there and uh, the team will get back to you. Okay, so that concludes the free time management course. Hopefully we've taken you from theory to action and you'll get the results overnight. As I said in the beginning, it might take a couple of days to get really, really good at it. But if you do this today, set yourself up, tomorrow should be a whole new world and things should change overnight. I so hope so. And please give us feedback. We'll improve this course over time. And there's some fantastic innovations coming with the product. I didn't mention we are building a mobile app version of the schedule. So there's a mobile app already on iOS and Android for all those other features I just showed you now. Um, however, this new time management module, the build's still in progress and it'll be live in the new year. So what does that mean? You can do your planning on the desktop as we were just doing and see everything. And then when you get mobile during the day, that combined schedule view will be the, sh will be the screen on your mobile. So your calendars together, all your to-dos and the red line moving down and you can make changes on the go. If you have an assistant who's uh, supporting you in the role, onshore or offshore, doesn't matter, they can be logged in on the desktop, scheduling your day, organizing meetings, shuffling to-dos, adding to-dos, removing to-dos, and that can all be coming through to you on your mobile whilst you're out there getting other things done and keeping on track and seeing what the latest is that needs to be done based on if you do give that level of uh, control out to your assistant, as we all should. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed the course and I really hope you get results overnight and apply yourself and give us feedback as you go. Thank you.